How's that? Yep. We'll get you to do communion together here. That'll be the last thing we do. Uh, this I have uh, one cough drop loaded and I have two waiting. So this will be like a two and a half cough drop sermon. Um, this morning I had said, hey, I've only got one cough drop and then Les Amp brought up two more. So if we went long, it was his fault. Um, this morning we're going to talk about communion and clear up a couple things and talk about what it is and what it isn't and where some of the ideas about communion came from. And we're going to look at those from Scripture. So before we get started together, let's pray. Father, we thank you that we get to be in your presence this morning. We get to be together um, with you and with each other. Father, I pray this morning you would hide me behind the cross of Jesus so your words are heard, your words are heard and you are seen and I am not. Father, because your words have the wonderful way of making their way into our hearts and changing us. Father, so give us ears and hearts and minds to hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name we all said, amen. So if you've not yet, not yet grabbed communion, you are welcome to do that. I think Bob has a basket, so if you need one, you can track him down. So this morning, I just want to be clear about um, a couple ideas around communion. One is there is, depending on what your church context was, there's different ways to think about who takes communion. In this church, we're very, very simple. If you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, communion is for you. There's biblical proof for that. We'll talk about that this morning. Some people say that we practice closed communion, meaning that you have to be a part of this church family to take communion. We don't do that. We, um, we practice um, open, um, or we practice actually what would probably be called close communion, and which is what I just described. If you know Jesus as your Savior, man, take communion with us. There's the idea of open communion, which means uh, anybody takes communion. Now, having said that, let me be very clear. We don't have communion police, so nobody's ever going to come to you and go, hey, you can't take that. Now, I grew up in a church context where communion was passed by the usher, or the deacons passed out communion, right? They'd come around with a little silver tray, and he'd pass it down the row, and you'd take it, and, you know, depending on your church context, we'd always look and see who wasn't taking communion, right? Yeah, because we are stupid kids. So, um, which sometimes grow up to be stupid adults, but you, you see who's taking communion, who's not, and you know, maybe they're believers, maybe not, or maybe they just got a lot of sin in their life, and they want to take communion, and we'll look at some verses about that this morning, and the struggle with that for me, it was always, you know, when Paul gives the instructions to the Corinthian church, he says, so let a man examine himself, and we'll talk about that this morning, but if it's just passed in front of you, you take it ready or not. And I always struggled with that as an adult. And so the very first church that um, I got to pastor that was um, not traditional, um, we had communion out all the time. You showed up at church, you could take communion. You didn't need me, you didn't need anybody else, you'd show up and take communion. There were obviously times where we did that corporately, like, hey, we're going to take communion together this morning. And so we would kind of line up and file back to where the communion table was, and we would take communion and you could go sit anywhere in the entire church building and sit and be quiet and examine yourself and make it a personal thing and, and not this really hardline structured thing. And in and, and the church that um, I, I've only taken communion with grape juice. Now, some of you in your context, you probably had wine. Um, I don't know if you can get wine in this little gig right here, but that would be hilarious if you could. I'm sure there is somebody in a 12-step program that says, oh, yeah, I can get you those. Um, and the reason we do grape juice is this. Uh, the very first church I pastored was a very old, old Southern Baptist church. Uh, the church was started when George Washington was president of the United States. It's very true. Now, there were some people there who thought they were charter members. Um, you'll catch that joke here in a second. Uh, yeah, it, parts of it were exhausting. But um, God blessed that people. It's very eclectic, all walks of life, and it's just a really interesting group, a lot like us. And um, we, it was still where they passed communion, right? So the deacons are coming down, and they're passing communion. And over to my right, there, was, there were three sets of seats. There was the center row, and then there was a row on the right and a row on the left and aisles in between. And these rows over here sat like six people maybe. 
And so I'm leading communion, and over here, um, right around um, where Irish is, there was a couple that I had won to the Lord. And I knew that they had been in um, AA, still in AA, sponsored all kinds of people, great friends. And so this is the first time that they're taking communion. And they had their daughter with them that morning, who was a teenager. And so they, they take the bread, and then we do the bread, and, they, and the juice comes around. And so I see them lean over and whisper, and then lean back. And the daughter has a grape juice, and she sips it. Then she leans over and says something to her mom. And so I'm trying to lead communion. I'm watching this happen, right? So you know what my mind is like. It's a racetrack, and I'm going, oh, what's, that? what's up with that? Uh. So I, after church is over, I, I find them on the way out, and I say, hey, what was that about? And they're like, well, we want to make sure it wasn't wine. Because if it was wine, we wouldn't take it. Oh, okay. Since it's a symbol anyway, the fact that Jesus drank wine, we all know that. That night at the Lord's Supper, he, it was wine. He used wine. He was used the, the wine that was already at the table. He didn't grub hub anything else in. It was just wine at the table. That's what he used. Now, the symbol is what's important. That's why we don't use Mountain Dew and Doritos, right? Because the symbol is, is what's important. And so the grape juice looks like blood, the bread. Okay, so that all makes sense to us. We don't have to belabor that point. So where did this come from and what's the purpose? That's what we're getting at this morning. And so we're going to look at the two instances, one is in Matthew and the other is in the book of 1 Corinthians, where the church is instructed on communion. The first one is in the upper room where Jesus is talking to his disciples. Now my conviction is that Jesus started the church when he called his first disciples. There's a bunch of, a handful of different reasons for that. But I believe the church was in existence as much as, you know, when we think of church, we have a very rigid idea of what church is. When Jesus was on the earth, that was not so rigid. It was very fluid. Um, they were believers. They were this. They were that. They didn't have a building like this. They were communal, and they met in homes. And then it was called the way. Now, Jesus sits with his disciples um, and, and by the way, let me say this. You don't need church to take communion. I've, I've said this several times. My best friend um, lives outside of Jacksonville, Florida, and he used to live on Amelia Island. And the first time I went down to visit him in his home, I hadn't seen him for like five years. And man, if you knew this guy, oh, I love this guy. And we are knit together. When I read, Jake, when I read um, David and Jonathan and their friendship, I know exactly what that's like. And Jacob and I, are, our souls, our hearts are knit together. And so I, I was having a hard time in my life, and I, I went down to stay with them. And they had communion on their kitchen counter. Now, in their kitchen counter, you know, the sink was here, the window looked out at their backyard, and communion sat right here. It was always out all the time. And that's the first time I had ever witnessed that. Most of my communion experiences were church. So I never, ever, ever thought about taking communion on my own. And so I saw that, and I was like, oh, God is good. God is so good. So I was up early that morning before they were awake, and so I, I take communion. And I took it and I went out and sat on their back patio and just sat there and quiet and still. And it was just me and the Lord. And some of you know exactly what that feels like when it's not all the chaos of life. And it's not sitting here around other people and you're wondering what they're doing. And it's just you and it's silent. And that is such a marvelous thing. Well, Jesus starts this, this thing that we call the Lord's Table or, or Communion. The night before he's betrayed, but the night before he's crucified, and it starts, they were gathering together to have a Passover meal together. So they were eating a meal, a very traditional, it was part of Jewish customs, and this is what, they had the Passover meal, and then Jesus does something very different. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. Now we're going to look at several very declarative statements that Jesus makes. We will also understand this. Jesus also told a bunch of stories, and he says, I'm the gate. He says, I'm the vine. 
Now, was Jesus literally a gate? Was he literally a vine? No, we understand that often Jesus spoke with word pictures. And words are important. So we're going to look at all the words, not just the ones that we want to fit our theology. Let me say that very clear. We don't want to just fit Jesus into our theology. My theology needs to fit what Jesus says. And if my theology goes against what Jesus says, guess what? One of us is wrong. It's not going to be Jesus. Take, eat, this is my body. So he takes bread. Now, usually at this service, Krista is here. Uh, Krista, has, uh, her, she and I share an experience together called the Emmaus Walk. Maybe you've gone on it. If not, it's wonderful. It, outside of my salvation, going on the Emmaus Walk is the second most significant spiritual event in my entire life. At the Emmaus Walk, you take communion a lot. I mean a lot, like four or five times a day, a lot. And oddly enough, it is never routine. Take communion a bunch of different ways. I've taken communion where there's this big giant loaf of bread and you rip a piece off of it and you go over here and you dip it in wine or grape juice and you take it like that. I'd never done that before. And that didn't fit my theology. I'm like, I've never done this. I don't think this is right. No, I did it because I didn't want to be the only one not doing it. Because I was a grown man and I wanted to fit in. I've taken communion where... Um, you, you go up and you rip a piece of bread off and you, and you take a cup and then you go sit down. I've taken communion like this. Um, I've taken communion where it's passed out to me. and I've taken communion a bunch of different ways and a bunch of different places. And I wasn't always right in, uh, in the right space when I took it, but I always took communion. And we'll talk about that this morning too. But Jesus says, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and offered to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is, my, this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the give forgiveness of sins. This is my blood, which is poured out for many so that their sins can be forgiven. So what is, what is the vehicle for the forgiveness of sins? It's his blood. It's not the communion. It's his blood. So Jesus is giving a very clear picture. Now, Understand that he's going to be crucified very, very soon after this event. Their lives are going to get chaotic very, very quickly. Life is going to be hard for them, and they, they will live in fear. And, and because life got hard for the church, the church grew. The church exploded in the first 300 years after Jesus, like all over the Roman Empire huge growth because life got hard. I wonder if we would rather have an easy life and never change than have a hard life and see the gospel change everything. We know by our behavior. So, this, this, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So he gives these two things. He gives these two pictures. One is bread, which represents his body. One is um, wine or juice, which represents his blood. Then he says to them, I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. Remember, words are important. He said, this is my blood, this is my body. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. He just calls it grape juice. He just calls it wine right here. From now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So he makes this prophecy about the future. He says, I, we will take communion again. We will have the Lord's Supper again. We will have the Lord's table again later. And I will not drink again of this thing until that time. Now, this is where it starts. Jesus says, eat this bread, drink this cup. This is what it pictures. So let's get to 1 Corinthians. Now, if you've ever thought, if you've been in a crazy church, and I have, um, the Corinthians make us all look normal. They were nuts. They came from an extremely pagan background, worshiped all kinds of false gods. The gospel showed up in their lives. Bunch of them got saved, and they were having these house churches all over the place. And they struggled to separate some of their old uh, religious practices, 
some of the way they used to think with what was going on in their lives now. So they get together and they would have big church gatherings, right? These big meals. And a part of that, they would throw communion in like as an afterthought, which is sometimes how we treat God. Sometimes we treat God like he's an afterthought instead of the first thought. This is what Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this to remember me. Do this to remember me. Do this to remember me. We do not call anything a sacrament. And we never will. The word sacrament means something that, it, that um, imputes God's grace to you. It has saving value. Communion does not have saving value. Nowhere in Scripture is it attributed, is it attributed for saving value? Neither is baptism, neither is marriage. Only the blood of Jesus Christ has saving value. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul said to the Ephesians, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. So it's not a thing you're going to do that's going to get you righteousness. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ. Taking communion is good and it's right and we're told to do it to remember this cup is a new covenant, my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion is a statement on your behalf that Jesus died and he's coming back. That's what communion is. That's it. So here's the dilemma. There are, there are teachings in churches that say that communion, this literally turns into the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. So here's my fundamental question. Well, when? Well, when? When does it turn into it? Because I got crackers at home. They're not the body of Jesus. Some of you have wine right now at your house. That's not the blood of Jesus. And if you brought it to church, it's not going to be the blood of Jesus. And if you brought a box of saltine crackers, that's not going to be the blood of Jesus. So when does it magically turn into the body and blood of Jesus? I will tell you about a lunch that I've had with several denominations. And I will tell you all the denominations represented at this table. One of, the friend, one of my friend Jacob was at this lunch. <coughs> There's a Catholic priest a Lutheran minister, a Church of Christ pastor, a Pentecostal guy, and Jacob and I. Mexican restaurant um, in Florence, Kentucky, where the KFC sits now. For those of you who know or care or don't know or don't care. It used to be a, it used to be a place at the Mexican restaurant. So we were sitting there, and this subject comes up about communion. And one of the one guys says to the other guy, well, what do you do with your leftover wine? Now, some of them have to drink it. Because now it's the blood of Jesus. You can't throw that away. So you got to drink it. That's, uh, uh, that's a lot of alcohol. One guy says, well, we pour it down a sanctified drain. Okay, now Jacob, now Jacob and I are sitting there, and I'm not making fun of anybody's, anybody's faith system. I'm not. I'm just telling you exactly what happened. Jacob and I kind of look at each other like, oh, somebody's going to ask, How do you sanct what's a sanctified drain? Well, it can be any drain. Well, how does it get sanctified? Well, we sanctify it. Well, how do you sanctify it? We just pray over it. Now you, so, if you're not drinking at all, you, you can pour it down a sanctified drain, or you can pour it on holy ground, which is a cemetery or a graveyard. And I'm thinking, I don't, I don't know if I can find that in the Bible. I, I don't really care what any denomination teaches. I don't care what the vineyard teaches. I don't care what the Catholic Church or the Episcopal or the Lutheran or none. I, I don't care. I care what the Bible says. I'll talk Bible all day long. So here's the dilemma. When you say, well, what do you do when your church teaching is in conflict with what the Bible says? Well, we will hold to church traditions. Clutch the pearls. That's a, you don't want to go down that road with Uncle Will. 
You just don't. Because what makes what your church teaches any more true than what somebody else church, te church teaches, if you're going to hold to that? So we'll just open our Bibles, and we'll understand as best we can what the Bible actually teaches. And your church tradition, if it's in conflict with Scripture, guess what? Your church tradition is wrong. This church tradition would be wrong if it conflicts with Scripture every time. So... Jacob and I are just sitting there scratching our heads going, this is nuts. No, you don't say this is nuts to them because you don't want to be offensive. And they were men that I, I was friends with and whatever. You know, we poured down a sanctified drain. And I'm going, yeah, but why? So here's the dilemma. When does this, if that's your belief, when does this turn into the literal body of Jesus and the literal blood of Jesus? Here's when. And I quote, it turns into that when I pray over it. I said, you mean you or just anybody? No, no, it has to be me. Oh. Oh. So if I take this without you praying over it, it's not communion. It's just bread and juice. So in order for me to take communion, I got to go through you. <gasps> I know. Can you imagine how mad I was? Yeah. So you mean I can't get to... I thought Jesus said he was the one mediator between God and man. I thought he was my advocate. I thought he was the bridge that got me to God. But you're telling me I need you. It's a lot of power, isn't it? It's a lot of power. So, biblically, well, that's dead wrong. That is dead wrong. You can take communion wherever you want, whenever you want. You don't need me or anybody else to make that into anything. You don't. For when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. There is nothing magical or supernatural hocus pocus that I will ever do that makes this anything more than what it already is because it's already a picture it's always been a picture that you weren't good enough to get to heaven on your own so Jesus left heaven and walked this earth for some 33 odd years and then he was murdered He was murdered. He shed his blood to pay a debt that you could never, ever pay. And every time we take communion, that's what we're saying. Every single time. I was lost. I was hopeless. I had no ability to pay for my own sin. But Jesus came. One of the greatest lyrics in one of the songs we sang this morning was all the wrong turns that I took. Can you remember that? that I, if I could undo those things. But you can't. you can't. You can't go back and undo any of that. And if you have Jesus as your Savior, there's no need to. The Bible says he has cast our sins into the sea of forgetfulness to remember them no more. That's when we take communion. That's what we're remembering. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. So let's understand what that is. Let's be very clear. We're unworthy. We're not worthy of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. We're not worthy of that. That's all grace, that is all mercy. So he's not saying that you need to be worthy. He's saying, what is the attitude of your heart if you take that in an unworthy manner? Now, I'm 53 years old. I, I gave my life to Christ when I was 12. I've taken communion a lot, and some of those were probably in an unworthy manner. I didn't take time to reflect. I didn't take time to be still before God and say, man, Lord, I'm struggling with this thing, or I have this sin in my life and I need to talk to you about this. I'm struggling with this behavior, and Jesus, I need your help. Father, I have a problem with Madeline, and I need to get that right before I take communion. You ever consider that? 
Jesus says, if you ever promise somebody um, and you're at the altar making a sacrifice and you know that you ever promised somebody, you leave that sacrifice there and you go make it right. What if every time you cook, took communion, you said, oh, I've got a problem with Stephanie and Lord, I need to make that right before I take communion. So I'm not going to take communion. Here's why that's important. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Oh. That makes communion a big deal, doesn't it? Not a saving big deal, but a getting my heart right big deal. And a man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks of the cup. Let's say right there. Let's go back to that, Allison. Examine himself. Now, Last year, um, I had some spots on my skin that I wanted to go have looked at. Because I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I've ever noticed that before. Maybe you should, no, I don't know what you, I, I can tell you what most men think about the doctor. Like, I don't need to go. I don't need to go. Just, just give me a shot. Give me a pill. I don't, just, I don't need to go to the doctor. Um, in the late 90s, I had um, pneumonia. I had, had it for three weeks. Worked every day, every day. I thought I was going to die. My breathing was <laughs> that. So I, it's, I had just taken my first ministry job, and I was I had employed a whole week. And that Saturday, I go to the emergency room at the old Provident Hospital in Cincinnati, and they they X-ray the bottom of my right lung had collapsed, and um, so they so the the doctor comes in and she's like hey we need to admit you and I said no we're not doing that <laughs> I said you give me a shot you give me a pill but I'm walking out of here and she and then she shows me this x-ray and she goes uh, no Mr. Stevens you're not leaving I was like ah oh, you gotta be kidding me so maybe your approach to doctors is similar to that it probably still is mine to some extent Last year I had some spots and I wanted to go, because I had noticed a couple spots on my legs, like I need to probably have a look at because I love the sun. I don't know if anybody else loves the sun. Love the sun. Love to be out in the sun. Um, I'll get dark quick. Um, I'm the envy of all redheads um, or just pale people. Um, so, <laughs> so, I, so I had to go for this examination. I don't know if you've ever had to do this, but I have. And you know, I'm saying, looking at this doctor, and she's like, okay, well, what do you want me to look at? And I was like, well, I can see some stuff, but there's some stuff I can't see. She goes, well, you want me to do a whole body check? And I'm going, no, uh, and yes, you know, so then, you know, and so I had a couple spots removed. It was no big deal. That's what we tell ourselves. But for the stuff that you can't examine, you have to have somebody look at you and go, hey, that's a problem. You need to do something about that. And the best tool that you'll have for seeing your own problems are what? A mirror. And you go look in that mirror and you go, oh. So, ladies, let me ask you this. Would you ever leave the house going somewhere important and your makeup be jacked up? Never, never, ever. And you look at your husband and you go, hey, how's my makeup look? Okay, let me tell you something. Here's his answer. It's fantastic. Because he thinks you're beautiful all the time. That's a true statement. That's a true statement. And ladies, if you look at the man next to you, he's going, amen. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Hey, Jim. Tell me, amen. Connie, it's beautiful all day, every day. Please don't hit me. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, you look in the mirror and you go, oh, that's not right. Or I need to do something about that. So the best tool for examining yourself is God's word. You look in the mirror of God's word and when God says, hey, don't do this. This is sin in your life. This is going to hurt you. And you take that time to examine yourself. Oh, that I need to get. I need to do something about that. Uh, that's if that's not hurting me now, it will hurt me eventually. 
that's a behavior I need to change. So let a man examine himself before he eats of that bread and drinks of that cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Communion and prepping for communion is a big deal. It's a big deal. It doesn't save us. It doesn't get us to heaven. But it's a great time to remember and reflect. Now watch verse 30. That is why many of you are weak and sick. Oh, I'm taking communion in an unworthy fashion, and I'm not taking time to examine myself. Paul says, that's why some of you all are sick. So spiritual, so the lack of spiritual discipline has an impact on my physical being. So we just said, lack of spiritual discipline has a negative impact on my physical being. That's why many of you all are sick and you're weak and some of you have died. Hmm. That's not a warm and fuzzy feeling, is it? You mean I you mean I need to be more serious about looking into my Bible, being self-examining, being reflective when I'm getting ready to take communion, being serious about my spiritual walk? But if you judged yourselves, we wouldn't come out of judgment. Would you rather look in the mirror every morning, get whatever dirt off is on your face, would you rather do that or go to the grocery store and everybody who walks you by you in the aisle goes, and they elbow the person next to them and whisper and go, hey, look at Look at that. You'd much rather look at yourself, clean that up, get it right. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So when we get ready for communion, which we will do that here very quickly, um, it's examining. You know, God, there's a lot going on in my life. Um, I'm really struggling with this sin. I'm struggling with this attitude. I'm Lord, I become apathetic about my walk with you. I don't read my Bible as much as I did. I, I don't turn to you like I should be. Father, there's stuff i got to get out of my life. Teach me, show me. So where does the idea come from that this literally turns into the body and blood of Jesus? Because some people will teach that. It comes from John chapter 6. This is totally disconnected to when Jesus gives communion in the book of Matthew, and when Paul talks about it in the book of Corinthians. But John chapter 6, Jesus is teaching. He says, I tell you the truth, he, he, he who believes has everlasting life. I think it's an important place to start. Words are important, remember, so we're going to pay attention to all the words. He who believes has everlasting life. He who believes. He who believes. So we start with belief. I am the bread of life. Remember, Jesus also said, I am the vine, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd, I am all those things. Jesus was not a literal shepherd, he was not a literal gate, and he was not literal bread. Your forefathers ate man in the desert, yet they died. Remember, you know the story. They were hungry, God sent bread from heaven, and they ate it. Kept them alive. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, he's talking about himself, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Is he saying, you got to take a bite of me? Okay. If you take that literally, you're going to have a bunch of problems. One, I'm 250-ish pounds. I know that if we were stranded on a desert island, you're going to eat me first. I'm, I got, I'm calorie heavy. <laughs> see? Okay, so, see how gross that is? So then why do we take this literally? Because in order for that to turn to literally in the body and blood of Jesus, I'm telling you that I'm the one that has to pray over it so that I have power over you. 
This is the bread, this bread is my flesh, I will give for the life of the world. So if you're going to say he, you have to literally, obviously that can't happen. So what happens to make, to make sure that I have power as a church leader in this context, that spiritual truth, I have to translate it into some kind of physical manifestation. So now that 150-pound Jesus, or however big he was, he says, hey, you need to eat my flesh. He's talking to real people in real time. None of them did that because it wasn't a literal statement. Verse 52, then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's a great question. That's a great question. Most of the time, the Jewish people who didn't like Jesus didn't ask good questions. They were just mean and hateful and tried to trick you. <coughs> Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That doesn't help me in my question. Most of the time, when we struggle with the truth, rather than just accepting the truth, we want to make the statement harder than what it is. Oh, well, God surely doesn't mean to stop that behavior. Well, why not? So you downplay it and you, and you dumb things down rather than just accepting, oh, what Jesus is trying to do is to get me from there to there. Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. This still isn't helping. So do we really eat the body and blood of Jesus? Obviously we can't unless we tell ourselves a story about communion. Verse 55, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. All that still, Jesus, you're not helping me here. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as a living father sent me, and I live because of the father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Again, this is very morbid. You think that I'm not helping you right now, and I am. Verse 58. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your fathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. Again, Jesus, we're hung up on this physical thing. We can't physically eat you. So... How do we figure this out? Well, he says in, chapter, in John chapter 6, verse 60, 63, he clears it up. On hearing it, many of the disciples said, man, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Still, none of them in that context were taking a bite of Jesus. So it wasn't literal. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about, grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. But you just spent a bunch of verses. Jesus, you were just using a lot of wind to tell us to eat your flesh and drink your blood. And now he says, the flesh counts for nothing. I'm not talking about my flesh. The words I have spoken to you are spirit. What we try to do sometimes is make it into something else so I don't have to obey. That's not what God means. God doesn't mean that if I don't have him as my savior, I'm going to hell. Yeah, that's exactly what he means. And this is what we say. What about all those people who've never heard? Well, they're not here. You are. What are you about you? What about my Uncle Bob who, he was a good guy, but I don't know if he was saved when he died. Where is he at? If he died without Jesus, he's in hell. That's where he is. Every relative I've ever had, people I love dearly, if they died without Jesus Christ, no matter how good of a person they were, they did not go to heaven. That's hard. I would rather have the hard truth than a soft lie. I would rather have a hard truth than a soft lie. So, my reality and your reality is this. 
I can't do anything about my uncle um, R.L. He's one of my real uncles. Robert Lee. Can't do anything about my uncle J.L., James Linville. Can't do anything about him. Nothing. But what I can do is something about the people I have in my life today. What I can do is be authentic in my walk with the people around me today. What I can do is look at you in the face and say, you need to give your life to Jesus. That's what I can do. Now, it, my relatives who've gone on, maybe they were saved, maybe they weren't. I, I don't know. But I know what I can do now. I know what I can do today. Communion, 100%, is a tool that we use to remember. There was a sacrifice that was made for me. That Jesus himself gave his body, and this bread represents that. And he spilled his own blood, and this juice represents that. So every time I take communion, I'm making a statement of that truth. That while I was yet a sinner, Jesus died for me. While I was hopeless and desperate, while there was nothing in me worth saving, Jesus died for me. While there was no good that I could ever do to be worthy of this sacrifice, Jesus died for me. So we're going to take communion now at your pace. Sit, pray. You leave when you're done. We'll play some music and wrap up. Um, if you're going to stay longer, I'll tell you how to lock the doors. But you take communion at your pace.